Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 300, uh, which is a very big deal, 300 episodes. I wanted to do something special for this. Unfortunately, it's been a, a Murphy's Law in full effect. It's unbelievable here. Now, for one thing, as you could probably hear, I've got some pretty bad laryngitis. Uh, struggling just to, to talk right now, so forgive me for that. And then also, uh, the big interview I wanted to have for this episode, Chris Avalon talking all about Baldur's Gate, Siege of Dragonspear. Murphy's Law <laughs> strikes again, and I lost the first half to a weird, inexplicable technical glitch. Got the video, but no audio. <laughs> Don't know what happened there. Uh, on the positive side, though, the second part is fine, uh, so we'll show that. And I think it's you'll, you'll have some fun with that, so <laughs> try not to think too much about this, what's missing. I'm going to try to get Chris back on later and uh, fill in the gaps here uh, so he can tell us all about the, his uh, work on the new uh, Baldur's Gate game. Now, after Chris is, is uh, after that segment, we will hear again, once again, from Richard Bartle, uh, who's going to tell us all about his experiences with World of Warcraft and some other uh, modern RPGs, EverQuest, some other things. I really think you'll like his commentary. It's, it's a lot of fun. And plus, it's from, you know, who would know it better than Richard Bartle? <laughs> he, has, he also has some fun uh, anecdotes in there about Lord British Garriott. So, <laughs> a lot of great stuff. I know you will enjoy it. So, uh, let me get out of here. Rest of the voice a while as you enjoy. Uh, Chris Avalon, followed by Richard Bartle. Uh, so there's a question from Gordon Westbrook, and he, he wants to know if you were dis disillusioned uh, with a Kickstarter for Bard's Tale 4. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, I liked being a stretch goal for that, um, and even though that stretch goal wasn't met, uh, I think the pro the fact the project got successfully funded is uh, is great. Um, the it's you know it's a little bit uh, unfortunate because uh, when you know Brian Fargo mentioned the whole like Tomb of Horrors idea like and I read some of the lore that they had set up for Bar's Tale four I got pretty excited so the next two days like I was jotting down ideas I'm like oh you know wouldn't it be cool if this or like there's a you know that certain trap in Tomb of Horrors but you know the Bard's Tale universe might be able to explore it this way. Um, and then, you know, then like it didn't quite meet the, the stretch goal. And I was like, oh, that sucks. But am, am I disillusioned with Kickstarter? Oh, oh God, no. I, 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 I love Kickstarter. I think it's one of the best things to happen uh, to the gaming industry because, you know, we get to finally go directly to players and go, hey, you know, would you would you want to buy this? Like, would this is something that interests you rather than trying to convince, you know, somebody else who might not actually be a fan or, you know, might actually just never play those type of games or, you know, purchase that kind of product. And, and then we can add, uh, there's, oh, there's so much stuff I love about Kickstarter and the fact that, you know, a lot of the digital distribution methods allow relatively small teams to actually release, you know, fun, cool games. That, and it doesn't mean like all the bells and whistles, but, you know, there's, there's certain things you can still do that fans absolutely love and, th and that's what they want. I mean, I'm not disillusioned with Kickstarter at all. I think Kickstarter is fucking great. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions about after after you're done with the uh, Siege of Dragon Spear. Uh, Timo Lange asked what you wanted to do. Uh, Paulo Comparis Comparis maybe uh, says, can we expect your future work, whatever it is, uh, to have the same philosophical depth that you've known you're you know become so well known for? Uh, wow, that's a very flattering question. Um, thank you, Paulo. Uh, yes, I hope so. Um, you know, it's kind of weird. Like when writing it, I don't really, I don't really think it's uh, trying to be philosophical. I just uh, sometimes I'm just trying to work out a question, or you know, I think a certain take on a character would be cool, or a certain you know take on a setting would be cool. But often it depends on the overall context for what that game is, because sometimes doing a, exploring a character arc like that you know, in Fallout might be a lot different than, say, doing the same thing in Numenera just because so much of the systems and so much of the context is different. Uh, so uh, I'd like to think that I'll still keep, you know, the same uh, level of, st of work, you know, that I have been doing in case, like, well, unless my brain fails, which is certainly possible. 
and some would argue that my brain has already failed. Uh, but yeah, no, um, I, I certainly hope to keep doing the same level of design work um, I have been doing. I really like playing around with settings. I really like um, developing uh, for fantasy, for sci-fi, for post-apoc, like whatever the games are out there. I wouldn't mind um, exploring genres uh, outside of role-playing games that still have strong opportunities for stories because I think uh, one weakness I have is um, a lot of the games that I've been involved with do require like a lot of like talking head conversations. And I think that maybe if I had more exposure to, um, to other genres and ways of telling stories that, that can't rely on that, I think might create some interesting results and it might sort of allow me to stretch my legs and stretch my brain a little bit more. Um, what kind of genres are we talking about here? Well, I mean, it could be anything. Uh, but, I mean, so for example, um, if you're playing... So a lot of the games I work on, like, don't have a strong multiplayer focus. Um, so it's okay to stop all the action and have long conversations like that. Like, but what if, but what if for whatever reason, you couldn't stop the action? Or you're doing a horror game or you're doing uh, more of a visual exploration game. Uh, what if it's a game that you know relies solely on telepathy and imagery? Like all that stuff feels a lot more interesting than, you know, um, I had more questions or I'll be going now. Like I, I know how all that stuff works and I, I still enjoy doing it, but I wouldn't mind exploring other ways of, of, of visual storytelling. I think the, the first opportunity to really explore that came with uh, when we were doing with, with when we were working on uh, Fallout New Vegas, because mm-hmm. so much of uh, Bethesda's engine, you know, caters to that you know open world exploration. Hey, what's around the next corner? Hey, here's the arrangement of props. Like, what kind of story does this arrangement of props tell you? And when we were doing like the the DLC content for New Vegas, like our budget was was pretty tight in terms of creating new assets you know, voiceover stuff. And I think that actually ended up being a good thing because then we were able to use a lot more of that sort of less resource intensive stuff, but use that to sort of tell better stories. And I think that worked out pretty well. Um, and then like it allows to experiment with things like, hey, well, what if the, you know, if we can't write all these words and localize them, like, well, then what may, what, you know, what if we create a character who, uh, you know, speaks with sound effects? okay, like, you know, R2-D2, you know, variations work. Like, I, I never really had an opportunity to, you know, to do a lot of characters like that. So that was fun to play around with. Or, hey, maybe this character's mute and she only, you know, speaks in, you know, sign language. Like, I mean, I, if we, you know, had more animation resources, maybe, like, you know, we could explore that idea a little bit more thoroughly, I think. And here I am moving my hands. Um, but, yeah, just aspects like that. So I, uh, it's, it's sort of like to just see what new forms of storytelling are out there, as well as continuing, like, doing work on, like, Tides of Numenera, where, you know, they do have, like, an interface set up like that. And I, in the context of that world, you know, writing the stories and characters for that is pretty interesting still. I think we've <laughs> answered most of the questions that Autumn Leaves had, had asked here. Uh, but one I think is, was pretty interesting was what setting or what uh, lore would you most like to mess up, uh, quote, unquote, Oh, okay. Um, yeah, because uh, actually when going into a setting, uh, I don't usually go in with the intention of messing it up. I usually go in with the intention of, well, what's what's unique about this setting? like, Or, or what questions do I have about this setting? Because with, with Star Wars, I went in with a lot of questions and uh, um, some anger. Um, and then angry questions. And then angry questioning characters, uh, but it, the intention wasn't really to mess it up. It just was to get some of those questions answered, or try and find reasons for why you know those answers are out there, or why people even have those questions. Um, so, so I, I guess I, again, like I don't, I don't go into it with the intention of messing it up. It's just that there's there's stuff I'd like to explore about settings, and there's I mean there's a lot of settings that that inspire me that that, are, that I think are interesting. Uh, uh, I you know I really like grounded grounded sci-fi and what I mean by that is like I've liked um, movies like uh, Europa Report and uh, Moon I thought were were really good sort of like leveled out sci-fi that still asks interesting questions has really good characters but it's not like you know blaster pistols being shot off every five seconds you know and light swords and things like that it's very it feels more human I think is good and um, 
I wouldn't mind, uh, and, and this was inspired by one of my favorite uh, comic writers, Matt Fraction. He, uh, he has this really nice uh, talent of taking a character that, quite frankly, is boring as shit. Um, and then he adds this wonderful human layer to it. Like he did this run on Hawkeye. And I don't like Hawkeye. I think Hawkeye is just kind of dumb and boring and, oh, wow, he shoots arrows. But then Mount Fraction sort of gave you the, the human Hawkeye where, you know, he's here's what his daily life is like and here's what life's like with his dogs and here's his relationship problems. And that may sound very soap opera and, you know, down to earth, but the way he presents it is just he makes he turns Hawkeye from this colorful superhero into this real person. And it's fascinating, and a chance to mess up, you know, a superhero like that. I think be would be a fun exploration. So, all right. So, just a couple last questions here, Chris. Uh, let's see. One, Michael Selva asked if you ever considered doing a board game. Ooh. Uh, well, um, so I can't, the reason I'm making the funny faces is because. Uh, <clears throat> I actually tried doing board games when uh, I was in junior high school and probably early high school, and uh, they were not the most successful experiments, um, mostly because anyone else playing could actually just beat me in my own board game, even though I was a designer, and that was pretty humiliating. But also, they just were were not the best ideas for board games. Like they, They'd be like, you know you know, maze running type of uh, challenges and uh, they just, it, it, I have thought about it. I've done it in the past. Uh, do I think about it now? Uh, not, not particularly just because I see so many, you know, better board game designers out there. Also, uh, I do enjoy playing board games though. Uh, a lot of the people I know, obviously, maybe because I, just work, I work in game development, like they, they do play a lot of board games. I really enjoyed um I think this is really isn't really a board game, but the Pathfinder card game I really enjoyed. Um, uh, I enjoy a lot of the Call of Cthulhu board games, um, even though Talisman isn't the most balanced game in the world, and you know can break a lot of friendships. I enjoy that. Like I like Illuminati. Like uh, you know I like Shea Geek. Like I there's all there's a bunch of stuff that I like. I'm not the best player in the world, to the point where other players will sometimes step in and they go, well, Chris, you should do it like this. Um, and then I just sit back and I'm like, oh, okay, well, obviously I totally suck at this. So anyway, but yeah, no, I enjoy, I enjoy board games. I probably haven't really thought about developing one just because there's so many, so many better board game developers out there. Yeah, that's some pretty stiff competition for sure. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> uh, here's a question for Nathan Robertson. Uh, when will you finish Arcanum? Oh my God! Yes. Uh, so Arcanum, uh, it's in the queue. Um, I had a choice between uh, developing more content uh, within a certain deadline for both uh, Numenera uh, and Siege of Dragonspear, um, and I realized that people could always laugh at me playing Arcanum later. But uh, those other games, uh, those were a little bit time sensitive. Uh, so uh, I did content for that to try and add more fun to those and then uh you guys can have fun laughing at me about arcanum uh, after that but no I, I apologize it's certainly been a while but uh other obligations that i think will be better for players in the long run um i usually put those first so all right so here's the final question i have for you today so if you were tiny enough to ride on a fox would you quit making games if I was tiny enough to ride on a fox, would I quit making games? <laughs> I don't really know where this question came from. It's Adam Anderson to blame. Oh, Adam. You'll pay Adam. Uh, wow. If I was tiny enough to ride on a fox. Okay, uh, so I would probably have to quit making games because if I'm small enough to ride on a fox, I'd probably lose a lot of design discussions because I'd be so tiny. Also, I'd have to live in constant fear of the fox turning on me. Um, so that would not be a very joyous life. I'd have to watch, you have to set up traps while I sleep. Because you can't trust foxes. No, you can't trust them at all. I mean, all, 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 the, all the media of foxes have shown me that they're just, just simply not to be trusted. Uh, so I would probably be too busy living in fear of my life uh, to even really enjoy riding on the fox. So thanks, Adam. Thanks for letting me. <laughs> really appreciate it. Well, thanks so much uh, for taking the time. 
No, no problem. Hey. Is there anything else that you wanted to, to give, give a shout out to or point out to bring Matt, that we haven't covered already? Uh, the shout out actually just goes to you. Uh, congratulations on your 300th episode. And hey, uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, thanks for the, the great questions, except for you, Adam. Except for you, <laughs> questions. Uh, I know I had a great time and um, don't have any particular shout outs except congratulations to you, Matt. Um, you should be very, very proud of what you accomplished. It sounds like you're not really pleased with the modern crop of MMORPGs. Or is there anyone that which ones? Which ones do you play regularly, if any? Um, I've just stopped playing The Secret World, um, having racked up 150 days of play. Um, I was the 50th highest um, player on XP at the time, out of the whole database when I quit. So um, I, I, I like that because it, they, the, the, that game tried to do something different. It tried to be, um, to break quite a few of the paradigms that um, have come out from EverQuest. And it had some parts in it which were just beautiful from a designer's point of view. I mean, it had the, the this skill wheel. Um, if you've never played it, it won't make much difference. But it had this this selection of skills and you built a deck out of them and they went together oh really sweetly it was, i don't know how much effort had gone into that but that was really really well done that's the sort of thing where if designers were allowed to give out awards that would have won one that was beautiful but being funcom um they launched prematurely um got um, bad press they attracted players to come in um but not um, quick enough then they stopped putting people to work on it and um, the mist kept missing deadlines missing deadlines like halloween you know it's kind of hard we weren't expecting halloween they knew halloween was coming but they if you only got one person coding it and yeah and when i finally quit it was um i would have quit earlier but i was waiting for the final tokyo expan uh, part of the tokyo expansion to come out when that came out i looked at it and thought oh they've got the same room layout 21 i think times and with different puzzles in each one so they're, they're doing their best with the limited resources but they really should have had more resources I mean, it's such a shame um but that's the that would be my current um what's your favorite M mmo from a design point of view it would be um um the secret world and if you'd asked me a month ago that would be the um the game i was playing uh, MMO is playing. Um, normally, I when I play them, play MMOs, I play up to the level cap and then stop. Um, the um, the one before the Secret World, or I should say, concurrently with the Secret World that I tried was um, Wild Star, and that was pretty good. That was quite quite joyous at times. That was really well done. But they it, it felt felt quite bitty. Um, uh, from the there was it, it wasn't so co coherent and my the problem i had with it was i'd started off playing as a um as a healer character because you can always get into groups as a healer yes you can but um to you also need to get to a level where people are playing in groups and that means you have to level solo and if you are playing as a healer in um, Wildstar, you will not level very fast at all. It is appallingly slow, um, and and I got up to about level twenty four, I think, and I thought I I could see where this was going from about level ten, and I'm really going to play through the rest of this. Really, no, I don't think I do need to. Um, I don't need that that qualification anymore. In the old days i used to write things about mmos and people would say well you write these things about mmos but do you play them and well no i don't play them because i don't need to i'm a designer i don't need to play them i just need to see other people playing them or read up on them and then you know i then i know how it will be well if you don't play them okay just for you i'll play them so so um i started i think with um 
I think it was World of Warcraft. And uh, cost, I'd been given a free um, World of Warcraft um, pack in America, which meant I had to play an American servers. That's, that's a bundle of fun. Um, cause nobody's around when I'm around, um, on American service. But anyway, I was playing on that well, and, um, Blizzard sent you a free pack or was it a friend? Or... No, no, it was, um, I was at a conference and it was a get your free Blizzard MMO pack here. Oh, uh, picked, uh, yeah. So, so I played that, um, I worked three characters up to, um, level 60, which was the level cap at the time. And, uh, then, uh, well, I worked uh, because that, that gave me the qualifications. That's that gave me these things like, okay, this isn't an academic or a journalist who's writing about a game with no knowledge of it. I mean, as a designer, I have knowledge of these things. And now, just for you, look, here's my character. And then they say, um, well, of course, that's just when the game starts. It only really starts when you get to level. Yeah, yeah, it does really it's only really start when I get to that level, doesn't it? But I knew that. I knew at level six how the whole game was going to pan out. I didn't get anything new. I just could, I could just see it all unfolding. Yeah, sure, I didn't know what colour um, particular herbs were going to be or what the names of plants were going to be or what actual specific dungeons were going to be, but I knew what the gameplay was going to be. And sure enough, that's what it was like. So, yep, oh, I kept on with that. So I, um, I kept on with World of Warcraft playing that. Um, played others, Lord of the Rings Online, Rift, things like that. Um, and then um, I finally quit WoW when Pandas came out. Uh, you know, <laughs> not impressed with the pandas. Jumping a shark there, and um, <laughs> I'd racked up two hundred and twenty-seven days of play on WoW. Um, so that's whatever that is, 227 times 24, that's how many hours I'd played it. Uh, and what do people say? Not um, you're qualified and not you're, uh, you understand the end game, but you're a wow fanboy. Ah. <laughs> uh, then the next one I played, um, Star Wars The Old Republic, which I really, really wanted to see succeed because that was go it, not only because it had cost a lot and if it failed, then we wouldn't get any MMOs, but because it was trying something new with the story. Um, so I worked my way up to um, the, the end game there, doing high-end raid guilds, got my full Rakata gear. Um, I, was, I played that for 137 days a real day, you know, um, actually elapsed time, averaging six hours a day. So um, I think I finished on May the 4th, which was appropriate for Star Wars. Um, and with that, the reason I stopped playing was because the game was all about the story. And when they were going to bring out the new ex, uh, expansion, they, they had two ways they could do it. Bring out more story or go into regular end game raiding, add more gear stuff. And they did the latter. And what particularly annoyed me was my character, who was um, female in that one. I, can't remember. I think she's called Marie. They're either called Marie or Polly, my characters. People tend to get Polly, so I go for Marie because I named it after my niece. Um, but the, um, the character in there, um, when she was in her full gear, actually looked like a Jedi. And when you looked at the new gear that was coming out, it looked as if someone had just gone to the sack shop and said, give me some sacks and then I'll put them on. And I thought, you know, that may have law behind it for all I know, but that doesn't look like the kind of outfit that's going to appeal to the people who are here for the story. They want more story and they're not getting more story. So that's when I stopped that because I, I, all I wanted to know was, how are they going to take it? It's story or not. And the secret world has really good story and they keep on with really good story um, all the way through it. That, um, the only difference is between that and Star Wars The Republic is in the secret world, your character never says a word. In Star Wars, you've got to choose a voice, but in the secret world, you never say anything. It's all, you know, it's, it, other people talk to you. Anyway, um, that's another 10, 10 minutes of uh, chatting with you and never getting a word in. 
Well, the I read in the news a while back that World of Warcraft World can, can't talk now. I'm out wow. of practice here. <laughs> uh, so I read in the news that World of Warcraft had lost. They're hemorrhaging subscribers. You know, they've lost three million, I think, in in three months. I, I believe I recall correctly but i guess they're still you know by far the dominant mmo in the market i was wondering why you think they've managed to have that uh, longevity and what what would it take if it's even possible for another game really just to topple them you know basically do to them what they did to everquest well there's more people who have played wow than uh, than who are playing wow all those people who have left have left for reasons some of those reasons are they're never going to play another MMO. Other ones aren't so much we've left WoW as WoW has left us. You know, WoW has gone, um, it, it tried to broaden its market by pulling in more people. In order to do that, it had to go more casual. In order to go more casual, you lose your core market and so on. Um, now, where are all those players? They're probably playing League of Legends at the moment or something like that. They're just treading water. And when what would it take to get them back? Well, I was at a conference in Hong Kong and I was describing this and um, this Australian guy who was also at the conference came up and said, Mazda X5. Uh, well, what's that? Um, your sports car? Yeah, yeah. See, in the 60s, sports cars were, they were bought, uh, the, 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 the best ones were the, the British and the Italian ones, you know, the um, e-type jaguar things like that and they were responsive fast nippy once you got in them you felt like you were they were great wonderful drives um what you 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 knew you were in a sports car but in order to increase to um sell more sports cars they widened the market so they put in things like more safety features um so that um, the the braking was more was was um, softer. It wasn't so sharp. Um, the steering was was power steering. So it wasn't um, so you, you didn't feel like you were turning the wheel. You just turned the wheel. Um, the the seats were um, raised up more padded, and eventually the sports cars started to compete with the regular saloon cars on the market. So why would you buy a sports car if it's just the same as uh, you know regular Jaguar? And Mazda were looking at bringing out a new car and one of the, um, the designers said, look, why don't we go for a sports car? Because all those people who liked sports cars, they're still there. There was always a market for sports cars. It's just that now the market's diffused. If we bring out a proper sports car, people will buy it. Trust me. And, uh, so anyway, to their credit, they did the market research and thought, oh, there's a chance here. So they made this, the, the Mazda X5, immediately became the best-selling sports car of all time because all those people who wanted sports cars and couldn't get them, they could now go out and play that. So now we're seeing... Um, the similar thing with the MMOs. People want an MMO that's like a sports car that uh, of the past, the ones that they grew up playing. We're seeing some of the some people trying progression servers. You know, start off um, play EverQuest as it was back in the day, and, and maybe a play WoW. Well, you can play WoW if you go into somebody else's illegal server, uh, but and play them as they were back in the day, and that's got some appeal. But you really you're really a it's like you're visiting the the, ta the the town you grew up in after you moved away years ago. What people want isn't so much the nostalgia. What they want is a modern take on what they liked in the past. And as soon as somebody manages to come out with an MMO that's good and it has the all the old features, so it actually feels like an MMO instead of feeling like Facebook, well, then, yes, that will that will um, take off. And all those people, she, WoW didn't take players from EverQuest. WoW took players from, we've tried EverQuest and don't play it anymore. EverQuest had 450,000 players and it thought w people won't be able to get these. You know, they didn't aim at the 450,000. They aimed at the 800,000 who had played it and weren't playing anymore. And some of those people, oh, wow, this is, 
just what we wanted. It's like EverQuest, but it's more expansive. It's less grindy. It's got a, 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 a nicer feel to it. You know, it's a more tongue in cheek feel. And, and, they, that, and they just moved over there in droves. The people who have played WoW have seen the pendulum swing too far the other way. They've left. If it comes back, they'll go off. Now, there are some MMOs that might do that. Crowfall looks like it might. Um, it's probably a bit niche in terms of um, because it's mainly um, a PvP world. But you, niche is all it takes. If you've got 100,000 players and they're paying you $10, $15 a month, however, that's enough for you to make an MMO that will sustain for ages. You don't need 7 million players. So um, that's what I would um, I'd expect a reboot rather than somebody coming along and, and trying to make a wow that's better than wow. Uh, although there are some, um, some in Korea that look like they, they're doing quite well. So if, if only they didn't have that dreadful um, free-to-play model that's going to put off anybody who wants any kind of immersion. So. You follow the whole tabula rasa. Um, I think you'll find it was called Richard Garriott's. Uh, Richard yeah. Garriott's, yeah. That's what it was called. It, that's what it said in every... Um, Did you ever every, meet him, by the way? I met him, yes. I met him once at um, Gen Con. He, he didn't know who I was, but I knew who he was. <laughs> he didn't um, know who you were? Oh. Well, no, he didn't kind of know who I was, no. I was, well, I um, I was introduced to him at Gen Con. This would be in the uh, mid-80s, but, you know, why would... Well, well not mid-80s, probably uh, early 90s, maybe. Well, why would he know who I was? Um, you know, he, he you never um, played this any is, mods. Well, if he did, he never said. I mean, he, he this was before Ultima Online. I mean, I knew oh, him oh. because I'd played Ultimas um, four, five, and six. Uh, so I knew who he was, but he didn't know who I was. Why would he? I mean, we exchanged a few words. He had a. I remember he had a great long plat or queue, I think you call them in America, right down from from his neck down to his. Um, belt, which looked like the sort of thing that, if you'd had that in England, someone would have set fire to it. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not trying to disparage Richard Garriott. Um, his publicists have got an awful lot to answer for, but uh, he's a solid guy. I mean, he, he he's done an awful lot for MMOs. I'm not trying to. I'm not in any way um, trying to be sn snarky about Richard Garriott. Um, there's a, a lot the MMO industry owes to him. Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, in the UK, um, he wouldn't have got anywhere because we never had any astronauts here. So you couldn't be the son of an astronaut. And, <laughs> and <laughs> but, he, but he did spend a lot of time in Britain. That's why he calls himself uh, Lord British. So, yeah, um, I, I've met him, but um, it was only for two or three minutes at a Gen Con and um, he was talking to somebody else and someone just introduced me and, you know, hi, yes, so what are you doing? I do, oh, yeah, and that was that. And so wow. he, I, I doubt he'll remember. That's <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode. God. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, once again, sorry for the missing Avalon footage. I will get in touch with him as soon as possible to see if we can do a reshoot of that first half because uh, I know you guys really wanted to hear about Baldur's Gate and he had a lot of great uh, insight into it. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, as always, though, I want to thank you very, very, very much for your support of my show. There is no way in hell we would have hit 300 episodes without guys just like you and uh, gals just like you perhaps uh, going to the patreon site signing up for a buck an episode keeps these episodes going and it really means a lot to me guys so thank you very very much for your support i think i will cut this new segment short today uh for obvious reasons but there's a couple of things on here i just have to mention uh, one is I, I will soon have anthony and nicola caulfield uh, the, who did the bedroom to billions documentary they're doing an Amiga one right now they're going to be interviewed on Wednesday I had to reschedule that uh, due to my condition here but on the positive side you got chances uh, more chances to ask questions if you have some questions you'd like me to pose to them just let me know remember they interviewed a whole bunch of people uh, the last one was all about the ZX mostly uh, but 
Uh, this time around, they're interviewing all sorts of Amiga personalities. Uh, Jim Sachs was one. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, another bit of good news, I have interviewed Alexei Pashinov, the creator of Tetris. Amazing interview. Uh, no missing audio there. Uh, so hopefully that will be coming up soon, so stay tuned. And then uh, Thamer wrote in with a uh, news item, Interstellaria. Interstellaria. That's kind of a weird title. That is a real-time space exploration and simulation crew management game that just came out. So it, he, he said he wanted to know uh, what you guys thought about that, if, if anybody's played it yet. Uh, it looks to me like it's inspired by Star Control. So anyway, it looks pretty cool. All right, well, if a man ever needed a beer, it is me. So let's take a look at that Ale of the Week. Uh, so for the 300th episode, I was really trying to find uh, something cool. And this really caught my eye. I guess I'm kind of a victim of marketing. I really like that Game of Thrones series, uh, the novels and the, and the shows. And they actually have a uh, an ale based on that now. And this is, I guess, officially licensed and everything. It's a brewery. Uh, the brewery is uh, Alma Gang out of Cooperstown, New York. I've had some of their other uh, beers before. Really solid company. Let's see, this is... 7.2% alcohol. I've got a cool label on there. Let's see. From the darkness I watch you, all of you, all of your lies with a thousand eyes. Pour slowly to not disturb yeast sediment, but with vigor to make a luxurious head <laughs> and free the bouquet. Part of the Duvel family of fine Belgian ales. Uh, let's see. 7.2% alcohol. So really, there's just no excuse for this to be anything other than, than a perfect 5 out of 5 drinking horns. Uh, I'm going into this fully expecting that. and But uh, anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. Alright, so I've got some of this Three-Eyed Raven here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> that just smells really nice. I get, definitely get that Belgian aroma, the bouquet as they call it, which... Kind of reminds me a little bit of champagne, a lot of citrus, a lot of peach. Uh, it's just very fruity and pleasant and aromatic. You know, it doesn't smell. Uh, you know, if you think if you, if you go, if you're one of those people that hates the smell of beer, you know, try one of these Belgian sometimes because it's a, it's a very different experience than say a Budweiser or Miller Coors, you know, that sort of thing. I um, mean, it's, it's night and day uh, in terms of beer. Um, but anyway, let's give it a, a taste here. It's, and by the way, it's got a big, big head on it. I had to wait a while, try to let it die down, but it's it's very thick. So definitely pour this super, super slow. And just, just take your time with it because <laughs> if you pour this too quick, you're going to have a, a cannon instead of a drinking horn. Uh, anyway, let's give it a taste. of an interesting taste it's a little bit nuttier than i would have expected kind of a little bit of a cherry blackberry uh almost sort of a coffee liqueur like uh, flavor there uh that i was not expecting from this let me let me try it again maybe in my <laughs> maybe this uh, throat condition throwing my uh, all factories off as well you definitely get sort of a, a nutty flavor to this a little bit uh, and then you get the sort of the cherry, the sort of a scotch, uh, bourbon-like uh, flavor to this. It's a, a very dark uh, tasting. Uh, not very bitter, though. It's more sweet than bitter. Uh, actually, quite pleasant. I, I really like this. I'll try it again. Yeah, all in all, I really like this. It's uh, a little bit lighter tasting. It's kind of... Uh, it just has to be kind of... Uh, oh, it's a very, I guess you'd call this a very sophisticated uh, flavor. It's kind of hard to pin down. Sometimes it seems dark, then it seems light, and it, sometimes it seems a bitter, then it seems really uh, uh, refreshing. So uh, I guess there's just all kinds of stuff going on. I'll try it one more time. Yeah, all in all, I mean, it's really, really nice. If, you, if you're looking for something that uh, has a lot of different different flavors, but not necessarily a flavor one particular flavor that uh, really stands out. I think this would be a good choice for you. Uh, it smells a lot like a Belgian ale, but then when you taste it, you get more of a, I guess it may be more of a black ale uh, like flavor to it. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's really, really good. I'm going to go, uh, 
I'm sort of torn between a four and a five on this one. I, I guess I want to go with a five just because I don't know how my, uh, my little illness here might be affecting my, my judgment of, <laughs> of this. But, you know, if it tastes this good while I'm like this, if I was perfectly fine, it would probably be a full five out of five. So <laughs> we'll go with that. Uh, five out of five for the Three-Eyed Raven. So when I was looking for a quotation for this episode, I, I looked for things with uh, a 300 theme. And I found some really good ones from one of my favorite movies, uh, 300. Who, If you haven't seen that, man, you really should, should watch it. It's, it's really good. And it's because it's got great lines like this one in it. Uh, so there's two people speaking here. Uh, I think it'll be pretty clear who is who. Anyway, it goes something like this. When we attack today, our arrows will blot out the sun. Good. Then we'll fight in the shade. <laughs> See you guys next week. <laughs>